Um, so this event is hosted by the Kentucky Native Plant Society. We are a nonprofit a statewide organization that uh, focuses on preservation, protection, and conservation of native plants and natural communities. So um, I'm just going to go right into uh, Dr. Alan Weekly's uh, introduction uh, because we want to hear from Alan. Um, so Dr. Alan Weekly, um, he is my personally one of my favorite botanists uh, in the country, in the, in the world actually, um, prominent southeastern botanist. He's a plant taxonomist, community ecologist, and conservationist, specializing, specializing in the southeastern uh, United States flora. So I think what's really interesting about Alan is that he is so many different things. Um, you know, he's a heritage botanist, taxonomist, uh, you, uh, professor, um, you know, works with so many different groups across the state to push some of these conservation issues. And on top of all that, he's created an awesome flora of the Southeast, which also includes the whole entire state of Kentucky. So I'm looking forward to, to Alan maybe uh, letting us know how much of Kentucky really is in the Southeast uh, as a longstanding uh, argument. Um, but we are below the Ohio River, so. Um, we, um, so Alan is the author, I said, of the flora of the southeastern United States. So if you um, uh, haven't seen that, definitely check that out. Um, various floras um, of different uh, states, like the flora of Virginia, and uh, uh, wildflower books, like Wildflowers of the Atlantic Southeast. Um, he's released uh, an app called FloraQuest, which I use frequently. It's much easier to use an app in the field than carry around large books. Um, so that's been a, a great resource. He's done so many studies and, and mentored so many different people over the years. Um, he's very active with the Flora of North American Project and the United States Na National Vegetation Classification. And he serves as an advisor to um, North Carolina Heritage Program and the plant North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. So um, very similar to, to a lot of the folks um, uh, here today. Um, he's also the co-founder of the Carolina Vegetation Survey, which you know we heard about from Devin's talk, um, starting to use that CVS methodology. Um, and uh, as a trustee and board member of the public and private conservation granting agencies, um, he has helped oversee $400 uh, million of land conservation grants in the southeastern United States. So this is, this is huge. Um, uh, uh, really, land acquisition is kind of the ultimate conservation goal is, you know, protection of land and then all of the other conservation strategies come after that. So. Um, without further ado, uh, I'm really excited um, to hear from Dr. Alan Weekly. Well, thanks, Tara. Um, I'm a little embarrassed by that introduction. Um, I'm blushing, if you can tell. Um, but anyway, um, it's great to be here uh, with you all. And um, it's been great to uh, hear the talks this morning and to also look around at the set of people um, who are attending and see so many um, friends and acquaintances and uh, colleagues that I've worked with um, and so forth. So um, so I will uh, jump on in, share screen. Uh, do you see a Marshallia? Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, um, my talk is sort of roughly divided into a couple of sections. And the first I'm gonna um, talk primarily about kind of the evolution um, of the, of the southeastern uh, flora. Um, and that has important implications for us in understanding also how to go about conservation. And I'm gonna talk about uh, tools for identifying plants in the southeast. Um, and um, sort of woven all through is gonna be a basic conservation theme, which um, in my personal philosophy uh, is the fundamental reason why I do all this. Um, conservation is, is really the, the foundation and the bottom line. Um, so the vascular plants of the southeastern United States, um, there are about 6,900 native species, about 3,000 alien species. Uh, fortunately, only a small percentage of those are invasive and problematic. 
And um, interestingly, also a few hundred where we don't really know whether they're native or um, alien. Um, um, so th that's a kind of an interesting set. But when we look at the southeastern United States, we see um, really high species diversity. This is a map from the from the Bone App uh, project um, showing areas of, of high species diversity. You can see these sort of um, scattered areas around the southeast, including parts of Kentucky, and also, of course, uh, California, the Sierra Nevadas, and um, and the coastal areas. When we jump up a taxonomic rank to the genus level, the, the map looks quite similar. But when we jump up one further rank to the family level, the map changes pretty substantially. And um, we see that, that the, the diversity at this um, higher taxonomic level is really heavily weighted towards uh, the Southeastern United States. And why is that? It's a, it's a really interesting thing uh, that, that um, California beats us on species diversity, but we beat California on family diversity. What's going on there? So it's related to ancient lineages and resilience through deep time. If we look at plant narrow endemics, California, um, the Appalachians, uh, parts of the coastal plain. If we look at tree diversity, uh, you always hear this stuff about the Smokies having such great tree diversity, but uh, nobody talks about the Red Hills of Alabama. Um, it's just not fair. Um, if we look at the group of plants called the paleodicots, that's like magnolias and water lilies and sororus, um, lizard's tail, things like that. Um, the Southeast is also really, really rich. And this also has to do with its ancient status as a, as a relic area holding uh, temperate biodiversity, a major center of temperate biodiversity. Native grasses, you think, oh, that's gonna be out in the Great Plains where all the diversity is. But no, the Southeast is also rich, including uh, <clears throat> parts of Kentucky. And I hope, I know it's the Native Plant Society, but I hope you'll let me slip a few, um, a few animals in here as well. If we look at amphibian diversity or reptile diversity or fish diversity, we also see that the Southeast is where it's at. And karst, uh, as you all well know in Kentucky, uh, karst diversity, the Southeast is also really rich in, in diversity of, of underground organisms, cave and, and underground aquifer organisms. So when you sort of put this all together uh, uh, as NatureServe has done into a map of biodiversity importance, um, the Southeast uh, is really um, a highlighted area. Um, but I also want you to notice that it's not evenly distributed around the Southeast. It's very patchy. And every one of these little patches has its own distinct uh, richness of biodiversity that's different from the other patches. So the Edwards Plateau or the Florida Panhandle um, or the Kentucky Bluegrass or the Southern Blue Ridge, all of these have their own independent um, um, biodiversity. So how has the Southeast developed and retained this biodiversity? I guess I'm gonna suggest that it is edaphic diversity, that is geology and soils, times climate diversity, uh, particularly rainfall and temperature, times fire uh, regime diversity, and then times time, both uh, really deep time of hun hundreds of millions of years and also more recent time of uh, the time since the last ice age. And so, you know, maybe sometimes we think of the Southeast as kind of mostly looking like this. Kind of boring, really. Lots of different trees, not a lot of herbs. Uh, you know, it's a nice forest to take a hike through, but sort of where is that biodiversity? Well, a lot of the biodiversity in the South is in the, is in the small patch communities, the specialized communities that, that uh, harbor a lot of these relics. Um, such as rock houses in the upper left or um, longleaf pine and other fire maintained um, pine land uh, communities across the Southeast or rock out crop, crop communities such as the granite flat rock um, in Georgia there on the lower left or high elevation summit communities like Grandfather Mountain in North Carolina. And so we can kind of describe the, that uh, the, the underlying diversity of, that supports that biodiversity, that has created that biodiversity in the old fashioned earth, air, fire, water uh, kind of paradigm. 
but we also have to add in kind of the crazy clock of time um, that, that has, um, has sort of altered and shifted all of this in really critical ways. So it's not that the Southeast is static. The change in the Southeast is both, it's a, uh, how, do we, how do we put it? It's both a, uh, it's not just a bug, it's also a feature. Um, and so if we look at the, the diversity of uh, physiographic provinces in the Southeast, uh, we have, have a lot of physiographic provinces. If we look at geology, such as this uh, map of Alabama, uh, we have tremendous uh, diversity in the coastal plain, but then also in uh, Piedmont, Blue Ridge, and the sedimentary rock provinces that uh, predominate in um, Kentucky. And we have a fair bit of elevational diversity, not like out in the West, but a fair bit enough to matter. And we have a bit of precipitation diversity with some of some temperate rainforest areas in parts of the Southeast. And we also have diversity of fire regimes. This shows a mean fire return interval and all of that dark red and orange and so forth covering most of the Southeast means that the more fire exposed parts of, the, of that landscape um, receives really frequent fire or received really frequent fire evolutionarily every two years, every four years, every five years. But it doesn't mean that every bit of that landscape got that. There were fire refuge areas uh, that were sheltered from fire and so forth. So high fire frequency across the southeastern region basically is another driver of diversity because it means that there's a diversity of fire um, regimes in areas that have high fire regime in their most exposed sorts of settings like um, dry ridge tops uh, in the Cumberlands um, and so forth. So um, it's also, I think, uh, important for us to remember that um, the Southeastern United States has been available for the occupancy of land plants since there were land plants constantly. It has never been um, under ice or entirely under water, um, et cetera. So it, it, it has been a refugium from, um, from um, ice ages, from um, periods of high sea level and so forth. And this is an artist's rendition of Archaeanthus. And I think many of you all um, will be able to recognize what this might be related to. It's actually a close relative of tulip tree. This is from 115 million years ago in the southeastern United States. So um, uh, it's fun to be able to time travel back. And people always talk about inventing a time machine, but it's really disappointing that nobody has actually got, gotten around to doing it. Um, I can think of about, I don't know, a thousand times and places that I wish I could uh, take that time machine back to. So um, a, a reminder of um, Archaeanthus's modern um, derivative. Um, but more recently, of course, we've also gone through massive climate changes, uh, the Pleistocene Ice Age and so forth, uh, which shifted things around. And um, so um, I just wanna emphasize that, that the, that the climate has never been static. Um, the Southeast has, has um, gone through shifts those do result in extinctions, but they also result in evolution of new species. And so um, Kentucky 15,000 years ago maybe looked like this. Um, so we have this permutational kind of combinatorial diversity of, of each of these different kind of factors and so forth that means that each place on, on, on the earth is, is, is somewhat unique or, or is unique. Um, and a really good botanist you could take and blindfold her and um, take on a helicopter ride and drop off somewhere and take the blindfold off. And she'd look around and say, oh, well, I must be in X county. Um, that's, how, that's how specific the biodiversity around the region is. Um, so, so I want to uh, go through a couple of uh, kind of examples of these uh, diverse areas. So um, the diversity in the Southeast is local in space. Um, any, any field biologist um, for heritage programs and so forth who's gone about looking for, um, for rare species will tell you, they're not just sort of randomly scattered across the landscape. 
they're in these little small patches um, and you walk through a lot of pretty boring woods sometimes to get to the small patch that has all the rare species. So the raisins and the chocolate chips um, in the cookie, not that the cookie's bad itself, um, but diversity is also local in time. And this is, I think, a lot harder for us to think about the, the important factor of time. And so the combination of those gives us this kind of crazy quilt of diversity um, in the southeastern United States. And I guess the one of the um, one of the messages I want to get across is is this is sort of exemplified by this slide. So the red areas are really high areas of endemism. The orange kind of next highest, and uh, to the two shades of yellow. And Kentucky is in here, and it has a good bit of that um, that uh, endemism and so forth. And um, as we have gone through climate changes in the past where cold and moister climates have pushed down from the south, such as during Pleistocene glaciation, or when warm and dry conditions have pushed in from the west, or when um, more tropical conditions have pushed in from the south, they move in and then they move back out. They, the climate changes again back to um, sort of our more um, standard climate of uh, where we are on the earth. Um, but when uh, those climates change, the species change too, they migrate. So we get cold boreal species that move south or we get uh, dry adapted grasses moving in from the Great Plains and the west, or we get tropical species moving up from the West Indies and Mexico. Um, and when the conditions change back, do all those species uh, just dutifully trot home? No, they, uh, they get scraped off in odd little microhabitats and, um, and so forth. And when they get scraped off in those places, if they stay there long enough, they evolve into new species. So uh, the change is uh, both a threat to biodiversity, but it's also a generator of biodiversity. So, um, so when we see these patterns, uh, the, these patterns often reflect these relictual areas where biodiversity has been um, sort of scraped off and left behind and then has evolved further. So Trillium discolor along the Savannah River, I think it grows pretty much exactly where it grew at the height of Pleistocene glaciation. It's mostly right along the river in the, in the river valley. And there might have been spruce fir forest around it on the uplands, but there wasn't spruce fir forest where it was growing right along the Savannah River. So that relictual habitat retained that species. And then most species, the ones that aren't dispersed by ants, which is not a real good strategy for speed, uh, most species then were able to move back out across the landscape. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is high elevation rocky summit habitats um, in uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, um, and some of the endemic species we have there like GM radiatum, the mountain avens. Well, this is the kind of habitat it grows in. And um, this is what Tara would be doing if she was in North Carolina. Um, but um, this is the distribution of the species. It grows only a, on about 15 different mountaintops. And it's sibling to two species, uh, GM pecii, that's up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and in Nova Scotia, and GM calthifolium in uh, British Columbia, Alaska, out the Aleutians to Sakhalin and Northern Japan. This is actually a picture of GM calthifolium in Hokkaido in Japan. And so these are sibling species, close relatives, but GM radiatum having been left behind here in the Southern Appalachians has evolved into its own species. Trichophorum cespitosum, the deer hair, uh, likewise um, growing almost always with uh, GM radiatum, but it hasn't speciated. It's related to uh, uh, common uh, populations um, all through Canada. So uh, a very common species that is um, just disjunct down to the Southern Appalachians. Houstonia, Montana. Now this one um, occurs is even rarer than the other two um, and occurs on even fewer mountaintops, has this uh, sort of bushy habit and brighter pink uh, flowers than its sibling, Houstonia purpurea, a common Southeastern species. So when we look at the, uh, some of the rare species in these high elevation outcrops, they have this um, strong signal of both new endemics and old endemics and unspeciated disjuncts like the trichophorum, 
that are recruited from very old circumboreal lineages, kind of um, things that you, genera that you would find in, um, in the Arctic of Canada or Sweden or Russia or England, uh, rhododendron, Sibaldia, GM, et cetera. Um, there's some really strong Asian affinities and that's related to uh, the connection of North America, the closer connection of North America to Asia than to Europe. But there are also young species of warm temperate or even tropical uh, kind of lineages that are, have been long separated from Eurasia, Eustonia, Calmia, et cetera. So um, it's not surprising uh, the boreal aspect when you think that not that many tens of thousands of years ago, the high mountains of North Carolina and Virginia um, had tundra and um, had many of these northern species. So a second example, serpentine barrens. These occur in Western North Carolina um, and in a situation where uh, topographic situation and elevation situation where you would expect to have cove forest or montane oak forests with white oak and Northern red oak and so forth, what you have instead is this. Um, it's kind of cosmically weird. Um, so um, the reason is the underlying substrate, the odd serpentine uh, chemistry of the rock and the soils derived from the rock. And so in these serpentine barrens, we have these um, disjuncts for, of Western and Northern grasses like tufted hair grass, slender wheatgrass, Elemis trachycollis, Sporoblis heterolepis, prairie drop seed disjuncts, Muhlenbergia agglomerata, more northeastern, Poa saltuensis, a more northeastern species, Gentianopsis crinida, Parnassia grandifolia, very weird scattered distribution around the southeast. This is currently under study and may actually uh, turn out to be several species. Um, there's some preliminary evidence that this is, uh, is actually more than one species and need, will need to be uh, broken up, um, split apart into several species. But we also have endemics like Symphiotrica rhiannon, uh, the Buck Creek aster that occurs only at a single serpentine barren. And at that same site, Pacora serpenticola, uh, just named in 2014. And now we're working on three additional endemic species to this one serpentine barren a hexastylus uh, with very tightly closed uh, mouth of the flower, uh, clonal growth, not very much variegation of the leaves with these long style extensions that are different than um, hexastylus aerifolia variety ruthii or hexastylus aerifolia variety aerifolia. And it also has um, a, a, a distinctive molecular signature, uh, these two samples from Buck Creek showing um, some um, amino acid positions that differ from any of the other samples of that complex. So in the serpentine barrens, we have a lot of um, Western taxa that moved in in the past during hot and dry periods, got orphaned and left behind uh, because of the odd geology at the Buck Creek serpentine barren. And some of them have evolved into neo-endemics um, and others are, are, remain as just disjunct populations. Okay, closer to home for the, those of you, uh, the, the Kentuckians among you. So um, these uh, Cumberland Plateau rock houses um, have also a, a very interesting flora. Um, this one, uh, Mononuria cumberlandensis, Cumberland sandwort, uh, very narrow endemic here in the Big South Fork area, uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, it's sister to the broadly Appalachian um, Mononuria glabra. By the way, um, for a species named only a couple of decades ago, this one has, has been entered into the genus frequent flyer program. Um, it's been earning a lot of mileage. Um, having been originally named in Arenaria, moved to Minowardia, moved to Mononuria, and is about to be moved to Porcildia. So, um, um, the, yeah, frequent flyer miles. Uh, Stenanthium diffusum, uh, narrow endemic also in the Big South Fork area, sister to the more widespread, but um, sort of oddly scattered uh, rock uh, Stenanthium um, uh, graminium. The Silenes, uh, Tony Romano uh, mentioned one of these um, 
So uh, the rock house catch fly, Silene rotundifolia, um, mostly restricted to these rock house kind of communities, not entirely so. Uh, sister to Silene regia um, and Silene virginica. Um, so two somewhat more widespread and, and uh, common um, relatives. Well, the regia not really more common. And then uh, Heuchera parviflora, uh, this gets into um, sort of new taxonomic research and also using uh, traditional and new methods like uh, molecular techniques. So Ryan Folk uh, studied this a few years ago and what had been considered to be a single species widespread from North Carolina out to the Ozarks, um, he split into three species, one with two varieties. And in Kentucky, you all have Heuchera parviflora, variety parviflora, and also Heuchera missouriensis. So missouriensis here is with the triangles, Southern Indiana and Illinois, and, um, and this area of Kentucky. And then we have Heuchera parviflora, variety parviflora, um, more widespread through the Cumberland Plateau area, but then disjunct over into North Carolina, a separate variety um, endemic to the Piedmont and a separate species out in the Ozarks. Geography is destiny. When, when plants or animals get stranded somewhere, they change and they evolve and uh, become new species. Another critter, sorry, I can't resist. Uh, letting them in as well. Um, but I want to make a particular point about this. If we look at the distribution of Heuchera parviflora, Cumberland Plateau here, and then disjunct over into the Blue Ridge Escarpment along the North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia tri-corner, and the distribution of the green salamander, Aeneides aeneas, Cumberland Plateau, disjunct over into that same area. Um, it should give us pause. It should make us think a little bit. Why would a salamander and a, and a saxifrage or a, a crag jangle, uh, an alum root, have the same distribution? Well, that's telling us something. That's telling us that uh, there's a similarity of habitat, but also a similarity of evolutionary history um, there. And so um, the green salamander is actually um, in the in the process of being split up into multiple um, species. This paper came out just a couple of years ago, well, last year, 2019, which separated uh, the hickory nut gorge salamander. Uh, the botanists among us uh, will appreciate the name Aeneides caria insis um, as a new endemic. And it, it, is, uh, it is this uh, branch in the molecular uh, tree and uh, there are three other major clades, um, a Southern Cumberland, a Northern Cumberland, and uh, a, an escarpment clade. And so as the authors wrote, Aeneides aeneas has been petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act and our study highlights the need for conservation management of this complex. Our formal recognition of the extent of uh, Genetic and evolutionary diversification of the complex is a critical step in establishing conservation strategies. In these rock houses, we also have things like Huperzia parophila, sibling to the circumboreal Huperzia silago complex. And then we have the filmy ferns. What's with the damn filmy ferns? Why do we have tropical ferns in Kentucky? There's something wrong here. So uh, Vanden Bashia bashiana, Didymoglossum peterzii, doesn't make it to Kentucky. Um, Hymenophyllum taylorii, somebody needs to find that. Um, a lot of these filmy ferns are mainly found by bryologists because they, they look a lot like, uh, like liverworts and mosses and, and grow in the same kinds of habitats. And uh, Crepidomines intricatum grotto felt. So um, these filmy ferns, um, these three, uh, four species of filmy fern are in very different lineages of filmy fern that have been separate for um, over a hundred million years. Now we don't really know when they arrived in, uh, in the Southern Appalachians and when they speciated there, uh, but they appear to be old tropical relics. And then we have things like uh, the lampshade spider, um, East Asia, Eastern North America and Northwestern North America. That's a pattern that we see over and over and over again. 
So the lampshade spiders. So a recent uh, uh, molecular study of lampshade spiders uh, found what they described as fractal genetic structuring. Um, essentially, every rock outcrop had its own genetically distinct population of lampshade spiders because they can't move from one rock outcrop to another. And so they've been there on each individual rock outcrop, isolated and evolving on their own. So they recommended that uh, there will be some um, splitting in the lampshade spiders uh, as well. Um, Hypochylus pococci and all will get split up. So these rock houses, they have these ancient tropical lineages of ferns. They have Northern cryophils, cold adapted things, um, spiders and club mosses and all, um, warm temperate recent derivatives. Um, and I think all this is because they are so buffered from extremes. They, they basically have this kind of near constant climate where they don't really freeze. They don't really get very hot. They stay constantly moist um, and the moisture further buffers the temperature. So um, I think all this has implications for how we think about conservation. Um, I, I won't read this whole quote, but um, Alan Graham um, in, in talking about past ecosystem dynamics, um, he said, what we are actually or additionally doing is setting aside way stations. We're, even if uh, biodiversity changes in a particular place, those places that have held on to biodiversity um, in the past basically show a, a, a resilience and a hope for the future in holding into biodiversity currently um, in our sixth extinction. So, um, so we have areas like the Florida Panhandle sticky spot. Um, so here we have uh, the Apalachicola River bluffs with things like Taxus and Terea, sort of ancient circumboreal lineages. We have the Apalachicola National Forest savannas with all these uh, tropical and subtropical uh, related taxa that have um, been retained there. We have this area in Washington and Bay counties with uh, all these are different habitats, moist bluffs, um, saturated savannas. These are uh, mainly sand hills, dry, really dry habitats and also um, seasonally uh, flooded um, um, lime sink ponds and yet they're all jammed in together here. So this suggests that this part of the panhandle of Florida is this ancient relictual area that has been able to hold on to lots of different kinds of biodiversity through time and through change. If, we're, if we want to bet where uh, we're gonna be able to conserve biodiversity into the future, it helps to pay attention to where biodiversity has been conserved in the past. So um, I'm at an age where um, I get um, mailings from my 401k and so forth. And they always have this sort of phrase, past performance is not an indicator of future results. You know, just because this stock uh, or this mutual fund gained 20% last year doesn't mean it's gonna gain 20% next year. Um, but I'd like to suggest that in biodiversity conservation, past performance is an indicator of future results. Um, because it shows where, uh, where the landscape has a kind of resilience because of um, its ability to withstand climate change and retain um, and generate new biodiversity. Um, and I'll close this section of the talk with this quote from uh, Charles Darwin. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this uh, planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So I'm going to move into the second section of my talk which is um, really about kind of um, um, floras and describing new new diversity and and so forth and I'm going to start with the idea that you can't conserve what you don't know about or if you manage to conserve what you don't know about, uh, you did it by accident. And uh, we can't really, we don't really want to leave uh, conservation uh, to accident. Um, and so taxonomic science is um, a foundation for conservation. And, um, and we've been able to persuade um, funders at, at UNC that, of that uh, to, to fund taxonomic science because of its importance for conservation. Um, and so, 
uh, in the talks this morning, we talked about uh, species as conservation targets and also communities. And uh, that sort of fine filter, coarse filter uh, uh, dual approach, I think, gives us the best opportunity to identify the most important conservation areas and work to conserve them. Um, so, um, so species are drivers of conservation action, where rare species are and so forth. And um, I think it's important in conservation that we avoid both type one or type two errors. I don't, uh, many of you probably know that language, some of you maybe don't, but, but uh, you know, uh, a type one versus a type two error, uh, uh, the type one error, do I remember which is which? Anyway, it's, um, if, um, if we think something is really rare and we try to do conservation there, but it turns out that it um, wasn't a good species, you know, we sort of wasted resources on it. Um, or if we didn't know that something existed, we, we hadn't described it, we didn't know that there was a rare species there, or we hadn't done the heritage style inventory to find that occurrence, and it gets destroyed without us even knowing about it, that's a lost opportunity. So, uh, you know, sort of wasted effort versus lost opportunity. With uh, conservation resources being as precious as they are, as limited as they are, we can't afford either. Um, and so um, a lot of what I do is oriented towards um, trying to help us not make either of those kinds of errors. Um, so um, Jenkins in 2015, based on vertebrate animals and on a few tree species, basically identified these priority areas uh, where a lot of conservation was um, not, a lot of biodiversity was not conserved. Um, and you see the same theme of uh, the West Coast, but then very broadly the Southeast um, and all. So um, if you look at plant species uh, that have been named over the last uh, decades in the Southeastern United States, um, about 500 species have been named since 1970. Um, and that's about 10% of the native flora. And I, when I tell people this, they're often kind of shocked. It's like, oh gosh, you know, we've been doing taxonomy in the, in the Eastern United States for um, centuries. Uh, haven't we gotten it all figured out? Aren't we asymptoting towards the end? Don't we know everything there is to know? And um, the sort of uh, both frustrating and exciting thing is, no, we don't. There's a lot of new stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff that hasn't been described. Um, and most of the new species that are getting described are um, narrow endemics. They're in heritage lingo. Um, G1, G2, G3 species. They're the highly, most highly imperiled, highly imperiled and, and, and imperiled um, species, the species that uh, are, are most at risk of extinction. Um, and if we look across the Southeast as a whole at the G1, G3 species um, across the region, something like 50% of, the, of the, these most highly imperiled species have been named in the last 50 years. So, you know, we got white oak right, and we got uh, other things named a couple hundred years ago, but we're um, still finding a lot of these new things and getting them described. And so, no, we're not um, uh, going towards uh, being done. In fact, the number of new species being named by decade is sloping up. And part of that is due to um, new techniques like molecular uh, systematics, uh, but mainly it's, um, due to biologists getting out and getting to these specialized habitats and looking with the recognition that there might be a new species there. So you can't um, find what you don't believe is there. Um, so part of it is believing. So um, there was mention earlier, I think by Tara about uh, Trillium pusillum um, and, and so forth. The Trillium pusillum complex is in the process of being split up. Each of these colors will be its own species, um, most likely. Uh, some of the work is still being done. Uh, Trillium georgianum here, uh, just a couple of uh, remnant sites remaining in North Georgia is, um, um, has been named. Um, some of these others are in the process of being named. Um, Ozarcanum and Texanum in the West have been named um, before. Um, tulip trees, something as familiar as tulip trees. Uh, Carl Fetter, my grad student, uh, did molecular sampling of this. We think there will be three taxa, probably one at new species down in Florida, and then two varieties um, named for the rest of the Southeast. 
um, a new highly imperiled uh, blue curl, Trichostoma nesophyllum, we just got described last year. It occurs on, on the main capes in North and South Carolina, Cape Hatteras, Cape Fear, uh, Cape Lookout, Cape Fear, and Cape Romaine. And in Kentucky, there's been a steady stream of new species being um, named through time. This is about the last 40 years of, um, of new species named that occur in Kentucky. Um, and we're not done. Um, I'm gonna probably move past this slide quickly before anybody complains that uh, their favorite uh, new species isn't on here or whatever, but uh, lots of new things uh, uh, coming up uh, that are being worked on and will get described. And once they are described, many of these will be narrow endemics and they will shape the conservation agenda in Kentucky and beyond. Um, but I don't wanna focus just on naming new species. There's also uh, the, uh, what I call taxonomic resurrections um, and changes in status. And this is one that was mentioned earlier and I threw this slide in while I was listening. So uh, Baptisia aberrans, um, the, um, the aberrant Southern Baptist, um, um, blue wild indigo, um, has been lumped often into Baptisia australis or lumped into Baptisia minor. And as such, it, it doesn't have that high a conservation status um, when you look at its G rank. Um, but um, when you um, recognize that it is actually its own separate species, um, its G rank becomes, um, um, you know, indicates a much more highly imperiled status and a higher conservation priority um, for Kentuckians and uh, other states that are uh, looking at this species. So um, now I wanna talk about uh, tools for identif identifying plants, for understanding the flora. And, and um, you know, I said earlier, you can't conserve what you uh, don't know exists. But I guess I also want to emphasize that you can't conserve what you can't identify. And um, scientific papers describing new species, um, you know, the ones that pertain to the southeastern United States, I think in the bibliography of my flora, there's about 6,500 references. So um, that isn't very practical. People can't go to 6,500 scientific papers, uh, uh, many of which are paywalled um, by the scientific publishers anyway. So. Uh, so what you need is floras, um, field guides, apps, et cetera, things to help you identify plants. So um, this is a picture of me when I was five. And some of you all will recognize the plant that I'm playing as a trumpet. Um, it's a highly hallucinogenic and toxic plant. Um, my parents knew a lot about plants and they really shouldn't probably have been letting me do this, but they did. Um, some people might say that um, it explains a lot. Um, but, um, but I grew up in a, in a family that, that spent a lot of time outdoors and we always had Peterson field guides. And I first started identifying plants uh, while I was taught them by my grandmother and my parents and my aunt and all but I first started identifying them using a, a Peterson field guide. And then by the time I was in my teens, um, I started um, using the flora of West Virginia. Um, I, I grew up in Virginia, but uh, um, I spent a lot of time without electricity um, on some land that my aunt owned up in Winchester County, um, uh, Frederick County near Winchester, Virginia. And um, she had a copy of the flora of West Virginia, the, the original edition of it or the original printings. Um, and so floras and field guides and apps nowadays, apps uh, are where sort of the rubber meets the road in terms of, um, of enabling people to access information about the plants around them. Uh, you don't access it by going to the herbarium. You don't access it by reading those 6,000 scientific paper. You access it through something that synthesizes that information. And so, um, you know, late in my teens, I, I started working with the flora of the Carolinas. Uh, at the time, it was sort of brand new. Um, and, um, you know, the flora of North America is 30 volumes. That's not very practical. Um, increasingly, there are apps and uh, wonderful wildflower guides like this one for Georgia done by Linda Chafin. 
Um, so when we wrote the flora of Virginia, it was the first new flora for the state in 250 years. Here's the old flora of Virginia and here's the new one. Um, and John Clayton came and, and visited when we, um, when we had our, our party for the new flora. But what I have found is that what everyone really wants is a tricorder. They don't want a flora. They, they, want, they want a magical device that they can point at a plant and it'll tell them what it is. And, you know, we're sort of working on that. And, and there, have been, there were various mentions of iNaturalist. I'll just talk, I won't talk a lot about iNaturalist, but I'll mention it, but iNaturalist with its um, artificial intelligence machine learning approach to identifying plants, you know, is sort of taking us in the direction of the tricorder. But um, it'll never really get there with um, um, a lot of the species that we have to identify. Um, it does a pretty amazing job um, on, uh, on a lot of species. So um, I want to talk about um, sort of floras and apps and so forth and, and introduce you to some of these. Um, so um, so I, I've been working on these um, for a number, for about 30 years now, um, well, the last uh, 18 at UNC. And um, we came up with a way of, of um, developing these kinds of tools basically by creating a database from which the tools are derived rather than writing a flora by uh, typing it in using Microsoft Word. Um, we have information in a database that then we can export in various forms and formats. So that's called the Flora Manager. Um, and um, from it has come the Flora of Virginia, the Flora of Virginia app, uh, the FloraQuest app, the Wildflowers of the Atlantic Southeast Wildflower Guide. And, um, and soon uh, we will have the um, a uh, sort of the even newer southeastern flora, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So this is kind of what the entry, some of the entry screens look like. Uh, it's just an access right now. We'll probably put it in uh, in um, an SQL uh, uh, format soon. Um, but basically, uh, these are sort of the entry screens and so forth that you can tap on. You get this for Heuchera parva flora. So you can enter in uh, habitat and distribution and comments and phenology, and this is the synonymy. And uh, you can click here to view or edit the distribution. <clears throat> Here's the keys um, that lead to it. So you can access the key directly from this screen. Um, the entry screen for distribution looks like this. Um, you can tap in different places in each of these boxes and indicate whether it's common, uncommon, rare, whether it's native or alien or uncertain um, and all, and also record information about its endemism and so forth. And, um, and then there's uh, basically, this is how you output information. So you can create a derivative flora uh, by choosing your geography, just choosing your taxonomy, choosing what maps you wanna use, choosing whether you want to insert photos into the, into the format, um, what sections you want to include, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and optional fields that you can include like Arkansas remarks or Shenandoah National Park comments. So that's sort of the basis for all these things. So um, the Flora of Virginia app, uh, we developed a couple of years ago uh, with uh, my colleagues in Virginia at the Virginia National Heritage Program. And um, it has a number of great features, uh, one of which particularly I want to introduce uh, to those of you who aren't familiar with it, and that's the graphic key. So it has dichotomous keys. It has the standard um, kind of dichotomous keys, but it also has this graphic key. It has lots of illustrations. It enables you to do geographic filtering by where you are in the state of Virginia. If you enter in your counter, county, it will basically filter the results for species that you're likely to encounter in that area. So um, if you were working in southeastern Kentucky, you could use this app and enter in Lee County, Virginia, the southwesternmost county of Virginia, and it would work great. Um, it has essentially all the content of the Flora of Virginia book, but you have it on your phone. And uh, it's a pretty expensive app. Uh, it is available in, uh, in both platforms. And a major upgrade is about to be result, released in the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you already have the app, it'll basically just um, um, refresh with that uh, new content. Um, so uh, the graphic key is basically um, a... Um, 
an elaboration of an idea that first came up about 30 or 40 years ago, um, and people did it using um, punch cards and uh, holes punched in them and so forth, but it's basically a polyclave where rather than a dichotomous key where you get asked some question about some feature that you don't have, your plant is in flower and it wants to know what the fruit type is, or your plant is in fruit and it wants to know what the flower color is. Um, this kind of key basically lets you enter in whatever information you have on the plant in your hand. And each time you enter in information, it subsets uh, the possibilities. So in Virginia, uh, 3,164 species. If you enter in that it's a broad-leaved woody plant, you're down to 474 already. Almost anybody can do that, right? You don't have to have a lot of sophisticated terminology or knowledge to do it. And then if you keep on entering things like the leaves are opposite, they're simple, they're palmately veined, lobed and toothed, you're down to 10 species. And then you can click show and it shows you um, maples and viburnums. And you can uh, make a choice uh, based on the uh, possibilities. I mean, maybe if you enter in enough information, you'll get down to one species, it depends, but you may end up with a number that you have to consider. And once you've selected what you think might be right, you can look at photographs, you can look at description and habitat, uh, you can look at range map, um, you can see the breadcrumbs of how you got there, what, what uh, choices you made that uh, got you to that point. So um, a great app. Um, so we also um, decided to do a wildflower guide. We did this with Timber Press. Um, I and colleagues at the garden, it covers this area. so. Not Kentucky, but uh, it'll work well in, in Eastern Kentucky. Um, so it covers eight states. And um, it also has this kind of simplified approach to um, kind of keying the plant rather than just, in Peterson's wildflower guide, you know, if you had a plant with yellow flowers, there were like 131 pages of yellow flowers that you had to flip through, right? So this um, gets you down to just a few pages by entering in basic information on flower color, flower symmetry, number of petals, um, and some simple leaf type uh, questions. So then you get to a page like this that, um, that uh, where you can um, sort through and compare the photos. So the big flora, the flora of the Southeastern United States. So, um, Back uh, in October, uh, we dropped 29 floras um, onto our website. Uh, They're freely downloadable. There's the full flora, there's five regional floras, and there are also individual state floras for all of the states. So this is the area, co area covered, and um, Tara uh, asked me to explain what part of Kentucky is in the Southeast, and in my opinion, all of Kentucky is in the Southeast. Um, so um, there's a pretty major floristic uh, boundary that is essentially at a, a, the glacial boundary. Um, so north of the glacial boundary, you have all this uh, country that was flattened by the um, by glaciation. Uh, the drainage was de deranged. It has bogs and so forth and so on. And in the um, unglaciated um, interior low plateau and southern Appalachians and so forth, you basically have this, these relictual residues of species that were, um, that were not rode, ridden over by ice. Um, so, um, so this is how I define the Southeast. So these are the little maps that are included uh, that contain a lot of information about the distribution and also the distribution outside of the area. These arrows show you where the plant occurs outside of the map um, or EN means that it's endemic um, to the area on the map. Um, so 10,000 species, uh, here's the download site, 1,848 pages. We've had over 3,000 downloads um, since late October. There are the five physiographic region, subregion floras and the 22 state floras. So if you're gonna work in Kentucky, you can download the Kentucky flora and it will work pretty well. It's not super customized. These are where the downloads have come from. Kentucky is um, doing nicely. I like that little yellow dot um, in Kentucky. Um, 
And uh, the flora contains uh, scientific and common names, detailed habitat description, phenology, distribution, the little map, um, comments, detailed synonymy, and um, hyperlinks to the NatureServe um, global ranks, the rarity ranks. And um, to show you sort of how the keys work, so when uh, we produce all these different floras, um, basically the keys get automatically simplified. So here's the key to Magnolia for Kentucky and the key to Magnolia for Louisiana. And you can tell by the key numbers here um, that something is missing. Um, um, so each, air, well, Louisiana has five magnolias and Kentucky has six, uh, not too much overlap between which ones are present in each state, but you end up with a functional key that excludes all the species that aren't in the state. So the, um, basically the computer automatically does that, the programming. So we're currently working on derivative floras um, that uh, will involve sort of not just subsetting, but then adding back additional information. So we're working on a, a flora of Arkansas with Theo Witzel and colleagues at the Arkansas Nature Preserves Commission. We're working on a flora of Delaware funded by the Mount Cuba Center um, with Bill McAvoy at the Delaware Natural Heritage Program. We're working on a flora of Georgia with Max Medley and the Georgia Natural Heritage Program. Uh, funded by them. Um, we're also working on a couple of floras and florulets um, uh, with the National Park Service uh, Cumberland Piedmont Network, um, a Little River Canyon flora and a guide to the ferns and lycophytes of the Cumberland Piedmont Network. So that would include uh, Mammoth Cave and so forth. And this will be with illustrations. This is a sort, of more, sort of a more public facing um, flora. So um, I want to announce though that uh, just uh, about a month ago, I got uh, generous funding from a conservation philanthropist uh, that will support basically taking this whole project to the next level. And we'll be reworking all the keys um, and optimizing them, um, making them easier to use for a broad range of users. Um, we'll be compiling five to 10 photos for every species in the flora. Um, including diagnostic um, feature photos. Um, we'll be adding in an additional field into the uh, flora on field recognition advice for families, genera, and species. How do you tell a holly from a rose uh, shrub? Um, and expanding uh, the kind of idiosyncratic comments about history and edibility and field survey hints that I think makes it uh, less dry of a flora and more approachable to uh, a broad set of uh, amateur users. Um, we'll develop the graphic keys and to do that, we'll have to develop a, a database that will uh, enable the computer to do that kind of sorting. Um, and the plan is that we'll release five, uh, probably five sub-regional apps that'll be similar to the current Flora of Virginia app, but with some additional features even to it and that will cover uh, Kentucky and the entire Southeast. Um, so um, those will be on iOS and, um, and Android. Um, one of the limitations of the FloraQuest app has been that it's um, on, um, on Apple devices only. Um, and we're gonna be putting in additional things like CFC values, improved G ranks, um, and doing this with an expanded regional set of contributing experts. It's really gonna, I think, be a, a pretty amazing resource for, um, for botanists and conservationists in the region. So uh, Tara called out uh, that I was gonna say something about Facebook, so I threw this in. So here's a few favorite Facebook sites for plants. Uh, obviously for you all, the Kentucky Native Plant Society. Um, I have a, a Facebook page or group, uh, Weekly's Flora of the Southeastern United States that I use for posting updates about the flora. Um, new species that get described, um, kind of fun um, plants that I see and so forth. Um, the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative has a couple of different Facebook uh, uh, groups, uh, but one that's uh, more plant focused is the Ecology, History and Biodiversity uh, page. And then two um, sort of regional pages that were created by Edwin Bridges are the Southern Appalachian Flora and Ecosystematics and Florida, flora and ecosystematics. It's really more than Florida, it's really a coastal plain, southeastern coastal plain. But these two each, um, well, 1.9 thousand 
almost 2,000 members of Southern Appalachian, uh, 5,400 members um, here. They a lot of really great information gets posted on these um, sites about that you can learn a tremendous amount from by just uh, going to the site occasionally and, and going through things. And then I was in, I was inspired by Tony Romano's uh, presentation this morning to just uh, briefly mention also, um, we've had a uh, kind of effort as well in North Carolina about finding Piedmont roadside native plant uh, uh, sites. Um, and this is a, an iNaturalist page that was set up by uh, Julie Tuttle uh, with 10,000 observations now and 164 people contributing to it um, of these, um, these relictual roadside biodiversity gem sites that um, are supporting a lot of the sun loving fire um, historically fire maintained, but now uh, mowing maintained um, um, plants in our in our southeastern region um, and all. So I want to close uh, with uh, kind of a, what I hope are inspirational remarks. Um, sometimes it's easy to get discouraged in the conservation business, but uh, these are uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and North Carolina Wildlife Research, uh, uh, Resource Commission biologists uh, searching for bog turtles on a very, very cold uh, December day. Um, and the dedication is uh, just amazing. Um, but we need to train um, the new generation of um, magi botanists and magi ecologists and magi zoologists um, to go out there and uh, conserve the really magical flora and fauna of our region, our southeastern region. And uh, uh, a North Carolina centric uh, photo here, but uh, heritage and state agency, federal agency. This is Gary Kaufman who worked for the Forest Service, what I call a combat biologist position. Um, people who work in agencies uh, that are of multi purposes, some of which are not conservation oriented. Um, Justin Robinson, a contractor for natural heritage. We've been remiss in broadening the scope of our human diversity, uh, supporting biological diversity um, in the past and, uh, and need to work on that. And um, just to the final closing is kind of a couple of word pairs um, and, uh, and all. Economy and ecology, they both come from the same root. Oikos, the Greek oikos, meaning home. And um, there's often been a tendency to view economy and ecology as, um, as in opposition to one another. And I think what we need to work towards is a realization that economy and ecology have to work together um, in the long range and sustainability and so forth. We're never gonna have a good economy if we, um, if we destroy the house, the oikos that we live in. Um, and all, uh, uh, they have to work together. Conservation and conservative. That's also kind of a word pair that um, has come to sort of be viewed as in opposition to one another. Um, and um, it's important for us, I think, to remember that a lot of great conservation innovations, uh, legislation in the past um, came from re Republican administrations, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, a lot of great conservation uh, legislation was passed under uh, Richard Nixon um, and all. And we need to reunify that uh, conservation is conservative. Uh, the, they mean the same thing, really. Um, and I guess I want to highlight the, you know, this, the, the legacy of land um, that uh, many of us who, who grew up and live in the Southeast, we appreciate the land for what it is. We have connections to the land. Uh, the, the younger generation less so. Uh, my parents grew up on farms. Um, I grew up in the woods all the time. I spent about a month of, out of every year with no electricity um, at, at our camp up in the mountains. Um, you know, without electricity, without screens, it's almost impossible for most of us to imagine nowadays. Um, but um, that connection to our natural heritage and the legacy of land is something that um, you know, I think it is a greater challenge than ever to, um, to convey to a broader set of people. And in the long run, you know, our, I think our conservation agenda will only succeed if we do, uh, if we do broaden um, the set of supporters and participants 
uh, through citizen science, through uh, through politics, through um, understanding the the science and having access to tools for identifying and learning about uh, what's around us. Um, so I guess that's my um, my sort of hope for the future. So curing plant blindness or uh, plant attention de def deficiency, uh, building uh, botanical capacity. I've always loved this quote from Baba Diem from the 1960s. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So I'll close with that. Thank you, Ellen. That was awesome. Um, there's been lots of comments and a few questions, um, but in, I guess, let's see, we'll take just a few. We're kind of running a tiny bit over, um, but I'll ask a few to you, Alan, and then the rest maybe during um, uh, the next talk, uh, you can uh, reply to some of these. Yeah, and I can also I can also stay. I don't know whether things are going to close sharp at the closing time, but I can stay on a little bit after. Okay, great, great. Um, yeah, there's just lots of kudos. Um, let's see, you addressed some of these already, uh, like the I, the iOS um, and the FloraQuest. You know, in 2016, the, your your FloraQuest app was the reason why I, I switched from Android to iPhone, and it's just been a downward spiral ever since. Um, <laughs> Let's see, uh, I'm going through, um, uh, there has been talk of, um, you know, will there be call for photos? How are you going to incorporate some of the photos? How, how can we help as a Native Plant Society, um, you know, for Kentucky uh, information? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, the, we really just got this funding. Um, like a month ago, and um, I'm beginning to organize things about that. Um, we we will definitely be putting out calls for photos. Um, we've also found um, on some other projects, and and Theo out in Arkansas has that iNaturalist is a great source of sort of prospecting for photos and then contacting people and asking for permission. You know where you can look for the sort of the right photo that shows the leaf arrangement or shows the aspect of the plant or the the plant in fruit or some diagnostic feature. Um, but yeah, we will we will be looking for, we, we've compiled about 50,000 photos of the flora of the Southeast, but we're gonna be looking for another 50 or 100,000 uh, probably uh, to, to add that. I think we'll also be putting all this up on a website as well as in the app. So it'll be sort of, um, once again, sort of uh, multi-purpose. Um, so um, I will uh, be back in touch with uh, the, the Kentucky Native Plant Society folks and uh, when we have more specific kind of uh, requests and, and uh, have organized how we can receive things, so. Awesome, great. 